As he has spoken in my ear, so will I do unto you. And Mark 11, 23, say, For verily I say unto you, that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which says shall come to pass, shall all whosoever. The second one I will mention is that the God you sad that be with you will determine the outcome of every battle mm. you fight. Psalm 20, verse 7 to 8 says, Some trusted in chariot and some in horses, but we will remember the name of the Lord our God. They are brought down and fallen, but we are rising and stand for the For John 4, 4 says, Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in you. The grace to say whatever God wants us to say for time. The right thing from the world. May God give to us in Jesus' name. Amen. And God will give us the grace to start the moment for the rest of our lives. Hallelujah. So from what I see here, the first thing that David did is that he changed the playing field by inviting God into the whole equation. Two things could have happened. He could have gone there to aspire glory to himself and, and speak of his, his own works and what he did. But the first thing he did was to say that he came to him with the, with the name of the Lord. And when we look at um, Philippians 2 from verse 9 to 10, it says that the name of the Lord, it says that, well, for God has highly exalted him and given him a name that is above every other name, that the name of Jesus, every name should pass of things on earth and in things in heaven and things under the earth. So when Jesus is invited into any situation, it, is di it becomes different. David had already won immediately he invited Jesus into the battle. It was not his battle anymore. It was even, if we, if, I mean, for a stone to have entered into Goliath's core and, and the score being one of the hardest um, organs that we need, uh, things that we have on our body, it was just God that was fighting that battle. So, and I just pray that um, we go to trust God, we go to not to ascribe anything to our own selves uh, and, and, and ascribe all glory to God.
This morning we can say everything has been said. <laughs> because everyone contributing has mentioned all the points one by one. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. We are looking at 1 Samuel chapter 17 from verse 45 to 51. 1 Samuel 17, 45 to 51. There are two types of weapons of warfare. There is the one that is physical, and then there is the one that is spiritual. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4. 2 Corinthians 10, verse 4 says the, the weapons of our warfare are not come. And the weapons for the Christian uh, in the battles of life are not the physical ones. We don't fight with guns, with bows and arrows. The weapons of our warfare are not come, but they are mighty. Mighty. When when you are always going to be victorious, it depends on this, the might of the weapons. When we call some people world powers, they are not world powers because they have a lot of money. They are not world powers because they have a lot of uh, uh, inhabitants. So on and so forth. They are world powers because they have weapons of mass destruction. That's what makes them world powers. People who have enough power to wipe out the world. That's right. In the olden days, uh, when the colonialists were around, they always built their houses on the hilltop. And then they have a cannon, a big gun, pointing towards the village of the habitants below. So many a times, the villagers will get angry for one reason or the other. And they will take their machetes, their bows and arrows, and they will be marching uphill to go and attack the, the white man there. And the white man will not uh, bother himself, he will wait till they have uh, reached the range of the cannon. In fact, just one shot. And when these people see all their leaders who are leading their so-called army slain with one shot, the rest will run back. 
for safety. Weapons are very important when you go to war. How mighty are your weapons? Now, this Bible tells us our own weapons are not carnal, but they are mighty through the Lord for the pulling down of strongholds. Second thing we note here, of course, is what some people have mentioned, that David said, I come to you in the name of the Lord. When you are talking about weapons of warfare, you need the weapons for protection, as well as weapons for attack. That's why you have uh, the shield to protect you, because the people you are going to fight, they also have their own weapons. So you must have a weapon that will defend you so you have to make you come back home safe, as well as weapons for attack. Now, Proverbs chapter 18, verse 10, Proverbs 18, verse 10, tells us that the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run it into it and is saved. So before you go to war, you want to make sure you will be able to come back safe. Um, that's the purpose of the name for the Christian. It's a strong tower. You can run into it and you'll be safe. It's also a weapon for attack. Because in Philippians chapter 2, from verse 9 to 10, Philippians 2, from verse 9 to 10, the Bible says, at the name of Jesus, every name should bow. So he was going with a name that will guarantee his protection, as well as a weapon for attack. And then, like somebody mentioned, another weapon that uh, David employed here is the word. What you say with your mouth is going to determine ultimately <coughs> what will happen to you. Pointed out with my ear coming from your mouth. That's what will determine what I will do to you. Not only that, in the Amori, of the children of God, the word, the word of God, is called a sword. Ephesians chapter six verse seventeen. Ephesians six seventeen says, "The sword, I mean the word of God, an unseen weapon, belonging to the Almighty Spirit." That's why you found. Uh, in Matthew chapter 4, from verse 1 to 11, Matthew 4, 1 to 11, that when Satan came to fight with Jesus Christ, all the weapon that Jesus Christ used was, it is written, it is written. That is why every child of God must be encouraged to memorize the word of God. You need to have the word because when the battle comes. It is what you have already learned that you'll be able to quote. Uh, if, you, if you don't know the scriptures and all of a sudden you are faced with a life and death situation, you will not be able to say, oh, I will live, I will not die, and declare the works of God. You have to have the word ready to face the enemy. Uh, and then another important point here is that David ran towards Goliath. The Christian is not supposed to run from the enemy. We're supposed to run towards the enemy. We are to be the attacker. When we were younger, and in football, etc., etc., the coach always says the best form of defense is the attack. 
Uh, that's why in our own time, they only put two people at the defense in football. Five people are in the attack on the front line. We don't have time, I, I believe they have been changing the system now. Five people in the front, three people in the midfield, and only two at the back, and only one fellow at the goal post. In other words, you make sure that the attack section is far, far stronger than the defense section. Five people at the front line, supported <coughs> by three people who can join them at any moment because attack is the best form of defense. We are not supposed to run from the enemy. We have to attack them. Uh, the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 6, from verse 10 to 17, Ephesians 6, 10 to 17, it tells us about the armor of God. There's not a single armor for your back. There is the one for your head, the one for your chest, the one for your loins, the one for your feet, etc., etc. Not a single one for your back because you are not supposed to turn your back to the enemy. The Bible says in James chapter 4, verse 7, James 4, 7, you are to resist the devil. If you submit to God, you resist the devil, the devil will flee. If the devil sees you, aggressive, they will leave you alone. The Bible says we are to resist the devil steadfastly. First Peter chapter 5, from verse 8 to 9. First Peter 5, 8 to 9. Finally, of course, at the end of the battle, the one who is called the champion is the one who is standing. There are two people, each one boasting. Goliath boasted, David boasted. At the end of the day, Goliath was on the ground, he said he's up. David was standing on top of him. Why? The one who remains standing after the battle is over is the one who is called the champion. Like somebody mentioned earlier on, Psalm 20 from verse 7 to 8, Psalm 20 from verse 7 to 8, it says some people trust in horses, some trust in chariots, but we trust in the name of the Lord. What is the end result of the battle? They are falling, but we remain standing. My prayer is that at the end of the day, you'll be a champion in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Um, if it are hello, Roy, oh, so it appears to come on Sunday school to you. I have a lot of my cafe, Tani Dapidi, to my purpose of any good play, of Benito, Pa, Goliath, three, ten year old, oh, oh, at my dear Tabaloka, with my Kikereka. Miracle <laughs> Kidding, <laughs> Because 